the Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to carrylutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. 1490 WGCH, this is Kerry Lutz. You're listening to the Financial Survival Network. Back with Chris Twain at don't-tread-on.me. And we're back to hopefully our weekly conversation about world trends, both social and economic and political. I guess that's three. And uh, Chris, what's going on here? I'm a little much better. I've been... Uh knocked out for the last two or three weeks with this ridiculous cold but i'm on uh z pack now and uh on the road to recovery yeah well those antibiotics uh, have you been on z pack many a time glad you're feeling <laughs> mm-hmm. better so so europe isn't gonna fail and it's funny i'm in my office here and the guy next door you know he's in business <clears throat> and we're talking three days ago and he says to me you know it looks like europe's gonna fail it looks like they're just gonna let it all blow up and I said to him, look, this is all stagecraft. The deal Mm -hmm. has already been cut. I don't care if they say it's illegal for the ECB to print money. It's illegal for Germany to be part of this. It doesn't matter because nobody wants to be known. No one wants to leave a legacy as the person who allowed Europe to blow up. So they're all going to come together in the end, and they're all going to print money because there is no way out of it and all they can really do is kick the can down the road fast forward to yesterday what happened right yeah i think the the kind of interesting takes i i got from yesterday's action is that um this seems to me the precursor towards something that they know is coming down the road when they introduce all these liquidity swaps they didn't necessarily print money they left money available for all the banks to borrow against uh, the dollar uh, very cheaply, and once that money gets thrown into the system, um, you know all these central banks can then um, borrow money from the Fed at a half a percent interest. Okay, um, borrow this money and then go to governments like Greece who have all these bonds and stuff, um, you know, or non-performing assets, and and you know banks can dump their you know unwanted assets to the central banks. And the central banks take all these assets off the market um, and, uh, you know, help clean up the mess, just like they did in 2008. Um, You know, it's par for the course. I think that they're going to continue to paper over any problem out there that they need to, Um, you know, trillions upon trillions of dollars. It doesn't matter to them. And they don't need any political. This is another point. They don't need any political uh, approval for this anymore. I mean, uh, Bloomberg did a Freedom of Information Act and. You know, they got anywhere from six to thirteen trillion dollars that the Federal Reserve pumped uh, into our into the world system uh, from 2008 to 2011, and there was no hearings, there was no you know votes of Congress, there was no Hank Paulson you know putting his knee in front of Nancy Pelosi saying please give us the 700 billion dollars. This is trillions upon trillions of dollars printed out of thin air, and you know what we're not seeing is. We're not seeing MF Global cause the same kind of effect uh, long-term capital management did uh, because all these things are now, they they have this course set off where they they just print the money and they take care of it quietly. Uh, They take the the guilty parties out to the woodshed. They take care of them um, and wrap it up and clean it over and paper it over real well. And that's why I don't think any of this, you know, (laughs) any of these banking problems are going to be the downfall to this system. There has to be a real, um, you know, something in the real world that causes it. Um, and I, you know, being a silver investor, I tend to think at, at some point, some real thing is going to happen where they can't paper over it. Uh, whether it's, you know, oil disruption in the Gulf, whether it's, you know, a, a default of the silver market at the COMEX, whether, you know, uh, there's a you know food scare and we see another run up. Something in the physical world has to happen. Um, in order for this paradigm to get rocked again. Um, Because I don't think it's going to be like 2008 where there's something in the paper world that got done because the central banks are doing now preemptive, um, you know, liquidity pumps, you know, ready for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm kind of in agreement with you there. I don't see, uh, you know, I just see them papering over this indefinitely just 
to it's Q E E quantitative easing European style, and uh, you know as long as they can keep banging out the units, and the units don't become worthless, or there isn't a massive loss of faith in those currency units, and it's irrelevant what you want to call those units at this point. They all have uh, no independent existence other than uh, on a ledger entry. You know, they they mean nothing. And yeah, and 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 all this money that they're printing, uh, Carrie, it's all staying in this upper stratosphere of money. I mean, you know, they get uh, you know seven hundred trillion dollars in derivatives now. Okay, mm-hmm. um, if even one tenth of one percent ever found its way into the real. Uh, economy uh, where somebody cashed out some of these winning positions and, and actually went to go spend it on real things like land and businesses and stuff like that. It would it would mm-hmm. blow up the you know the the real world economy. So all these trillions of dollars that they're printing, it's in this other stratosphere, um, you know, in the banking world where it doesn't affect into the real world. But this isn't going to last forever because some of these big power guys. I mean, I was just on David Morgan's um, uh, mastermind series this past. A right. week or two. I saw that. And, uh, you know, my, my, my point to these guys are, because a lot of these guys are fund managers, is that the system, you know, it, it's a musical chair system. And at some point, somebody's going to say, hey, you know, I want out. And it's going to take that one guy at the margin um, to take his money from this fake, you know, paper digital, you know, I have a brokerage account with, you know, eight figures in it, and start uh-huh. pumping it into the real world that's going to cause um you know this this break and once that pins popped man that's it yeah it's game over right so it's yep. a, it's a big confidence scheme right that's what we uh that's what we call these things because it all relies upon the confidence of the public to keep on using these units and i was talking to uh Chris Vermeulen yesterday, and you know he just thinks they'll keep coming up with new systems. You know the dollar will go, and then they'll come up with a new one. But once the confidence is gone, it's like once the love is gone in a relationship, it's real mm-hmm. hard to ever get it back. Uh, yeah, you need a lot of therapy and a lot of hand holding and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, deliveries of flowers to ever get the love back. And, if uh, if it ever does, yeah, I mean, if ever. that's the thing with all paper currencies. Once faith is lost, it's it's gone forever. I mean, I don't know of any currency that was able to reestablish itself after you know massive abuse, you know, and, and it's just and, and it has to happen. I mean, this abuse has to happen in order to keep the system going. And you know, this is a line I keep saying over and over again. And I hope it you know enters in the. You know, social you know landscape, but more debt has mm-hmm. to be created every year uh, in excess of the debt and interest accrued the year before, or else the whole system has the mother of all margin calls, yeah. and uh, and that's not what the the owners want. It, it's funny. Uh, I'm I'm uh, listening to a lecture series on World War One because that was such a pivotal event in the whole uh, evolution of big government and overreaching government. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about how, like in England, they had this massive inflation and prices went up 10 times, but wages only went up, only doubled. And that's the problem with the inflation thing is that uh, the wages don't keep up with the prices and eventually it blows up. I wanted to tell you, like this week I went to see uh, Rush Limbaugh live in Manhattan Mm -hmm. at the uh, Town Hall Theater. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's mainly there from a technical aspect. I don't really listen to him anymore. He's Uh, a good broadcaster, though. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Hey, he's a master. You know, we should all we should all aspire to his level of broadcasting excellence because, you know, honestly, I listened. I looked at him. He was a backup. He gained another 40 pounds, gained all that weight back. He looked like hell. Yeah, I thought he would sounded a little short of breath. Um, well, that'll do it. Yeah, yeah and uh, you know, his voice wasn't as strong. You know, it's like when you go on the radio, they compress it, they do stuff to it. His voice <clears throat> wasn't as good as I expected it. Plus, they don't use really fine microphones. Well, you know, what did he talk things. about, Kerry? Because I mean, Rush was a guy I was enamored with for mm. years. Uh, I went to his show uh, back. In the 90s, when he had this show, I had both of my 
book signed when I was in the College Republicans, and he was a guy that I felt like everything he said, I agreed with. And I haven't listened to him in, I don't know, 10, yeah. 15 years, and certainly not since I've been awake. But <laughs> how, where, like, where does he stand on what's going on? I mean, does he ever address the issues that we touch, or is he still in this left-right paradigm where the, you know, the yeah, Obama's the bad problem. guy? And the, you, you nailed it, Chris. Let me, yeah. let me just say this, okay? You and I, I consider to be trans-political. Because mm-hmm. these parties, it's just like the guys on Wall Street. The people in the parties cause the spending. They uh, or they're, they're mass, their masters are Wall Street, and they they're the ones responsible for the mess that the country's in by the policies, the laws, etc. So to think that you're going to replace these guys with other guys who want to be just like them and then mm-hmm. get a solution to the problem cannot happen. So. No. I'm against that duality thing because both of them, you know, the Republicans have their ideology of so-called limited government and, uh, you know, uh, keeping, you know, low taxes, blah, blah, blah. The Democrats are big government helping the little guy. And yet neither of them adhere to any ideology. It's not about ideology. So forget the parties. They're not the answer to the question. They are the problem. And that's why. So I'm listening to him. And it's like, hey, Rush, you're good. You're a great speaker. Great sense of humor. Great storyteller. I mean, the guy is an amazing raconteur. But he doesn't Mm -hmm. talk about how corrupt and rotten the system is at its core. And that's what it's about. This is the problem. Which You and I, we're talking about the truth. But we don't have 20 million people listening to us. (laughs) But he seems to be getting more and more enamored of Ron Paul. One thing that he did talk about, I just want to Mm -hmm. cover real quick, American exceptionalism. All right. Mm -hmm. It's not the concept that we are the chosen people. We are exceptional. What he Mm -hmm. describes it as the founding of the country with people who had, you know, were really smart people who had amazing, uh, intense core beliefs And they were able to establish something totally different where you had a government of limited powers and that responsibility for one's life, you know, rested with the individual. The individual was sovereign. And I think so. He said that, right? Yeah. And I think. All right. So what do we have now that (laughs) resembles anywhere close to that? (laughs) Hey, you tell me, what do we got? Creeping fascism. They just passed a bill in the Senate that everybody could be a terrorist uh, and they could detain you if you're a terrorist in the U.S. with no trial, no nothing. And we'll yep. see if it gets through the House. But, you know, that's we've got fascism, totalitarianism, collectivism, and every other negative-ism that you can imagine. Yep. So, you know, we're, like you say, where does it leave us? But, yep. you know, to go see him, and then the crowd is so transfixed by him. Like oh, he, yeah. He I mean, I, in, and I, was, I was one of them. So, ditto head, I know what, mega dittos, yeah, yeah, giga yeah. dittos, terra dittos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you have to understand that the guy does have some of the equation right, in my opinion. But, you know, let's face it, the guy's worth upwards of a billion dollars. He's got a real vested interest in the system yeah. staying the way it is. And, and that's why you're never going to find anybody who's really successful in the system um, you know, to speak out against it because they have too much at stake. I mean, guys like me and you, I mean, yeah, we're all right, but, you know, we're certainly not, you know, sitting on top of, you know, millions upon millions of dollars with, you know, our image and, and uh, our friends and our network and all that other stuff that's all tied together. That's why I watch so many of these guys on CNBC and, you know, some of these big guys, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they speak half truths, they speak 90% truths, but um, they're never going to point at, you know, the Federal Reserve, they're never going to point at, exactly. you know, the collectivist party. They're never going to point at, you know, the, the, a different consciousness. They're never going to, you know, say, hey, let's get back to the, the, you know, to the Constitution. And that's why Ron Paul, 